with me, your man, Louis T. Welcome to the 2019 NFL Draft Wrap-Up Series where your man, Louis T., aims to break down all 32 teams in the National Football League's 2019 NFL Draft using our baseball grading scale. Single, double, triple, home run. There are no strikeouts here in the Draft Wrap-Up Series. We cannot tell how these players are going to pan out, and I don't want to discount any of these young men before they get their chance in the National Football League. And so, we'll get a score for each and every single player selected in X said team's draft. We'll apply bonuses when necessary, get an aggregate score, divide by the number of picks, which will yield us an overall grade for that team's draft. We'll then move on to the next team in the series picked by you. That's right. You, the viewer out there, are in total control as this is the you pick format. Simply be the first to leave a comment in the comment section of this and future videos stating two things. The phrase next and the team you'd like to see next. Some examples would be Fins next, Dolphins next, next Miami, next MIA. You get where I'm going with this. As a matter of fact, the next team up in the series is none other than the Miami Dolphins. And this is an organization that I feel like routinely this time of the year, I'm asking myself, what the hell are the Dolphins doing? I never fully understand the direction the Dolphins are going in. I never have any confidence that the Dolphins are going to be any good. And it's frustrating because four or five years ago, I would tell everybody that would listen that the Dolphins are one of the most talented football teams in the league. If you look at their roster, top to bottom, they've got talent everywhere you look. And if these guys uh, realize their full potential and maximize their talents, the Dolphins could be one of those teams that could jump up and bite you. And what happened two years ago? You won 10 games, you made it to the postseason, and you did it with Matt Moore and a bunch of other guys at quarterback, it seemed like. Tannehill got injured, and Matt Moore came in, and you won you made it to the postseason. And I said, look, that's the mark of a talented football team. When the guys go down, other players step in, you don't miss a beat, and you continue on. And I, I'm not, I was never an Adam Gase fan. You know that if you've watched for me for any amount of time. You know I was not a huge Adam Gase guy because I told you. And the Jets are going to find this out in due time. And they've already found out that he can be very messy, and he's already been messy in New York, and they already got a mess on their hands already with Gase uh, as their head coach. And they're going to find out. Trust me, you already know what they're going to find out uh, in due time, but that he's not a leader of men. He's not a people person. Adam Gase is a smart, brilliant, offensive-minded coach that just isn't good with people. He's socially awkward, period, all right? But that's nor here nor there. I never saw the vision that he had when he decided that, all the good players worth keeping needed to go and that you needed to build a culture that he wasn't going to be around to coach. Similar to what, and I, I feel the same way about Josh McDaniels in New England. He's got the same kind of egotistical personality that Adam Gase has where I'm the smartest guy in the room and I know what I'm doing and you can't tell me anything. And that's what led him to get rid of Jay Cutler and Brandon Marshall in Denver and turn that organization upside down. Well, Adam Gates did the same thing here, getting rid of all of your good football players. And, and again, maybe those guys needed to go. I'm not here to harp and dwell on the past. All I know is that it put you in a bind roster-wise where the talent isn't as great as it once was. I'm not going to sit here and lie to you and tell you that you have the uh, top five talent in this league as I once thought you did. But uh, you have something different going on in Miami. Again, I don't don't ask me about the direction. Maybe you as Dolphins fans out there understand the direction of this franchise a lot better than I do. There was a, a rumor at one point that you weren't looking for a quarterback and you trade for Josh Rosen. We're going to talk about that because it, to me, Josh Rosen is a part of this draft. It, let's face it. Your second round pick, you don't have technically a second round pick. Josh Rosen is your second round pick this year. He's a part of this draft. And, and if anyone is an analyzing and assessing this draft and not adding Josh Rosen and his um, trade to this draft, then they're doing this draft a disservice. But that's nor here nor there. Uh, I look at this team and this franchise, and for the first time, maybe in a while, and maybe you, you had hope that Adam Gase wasn't as bad as people like myself thought he was, but for the first time in a long time, you have hope. Maybe there's real hope in Miami that even if you're not good in, say, 2019, and, and I, right now I look at this team and I don't think you're going to be very good. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not, again, I'm not here to sell you on, on the, the, the state of the franchise, and I'm not here to sell you a drink. What I'm here is to be real with you, and if you don't like real, then this may not be the channel nor the, the video for you. But maybe that this coach in Brian Flores, who you got from New England, and we I've said this numerous times, I even did a video on Brian Flores when he got the job and talked about what I hoped for him and this organization. 
You know, I want to see him succeed. One, he's a brother. Two, he's a brother. And three, I'd like to see someone at least make New England work into week 16 before they clinch the division. I'm tired of seeing New England clinch the division in week 11. All right? Yep, Patriots have won the, the AFC East in week 12. God damn it, can they be forced to play week 17 with anything other than the number one seed in the AFC on the line? Could the AFC East still be within question and in doubt in week 16? I'm just looking for someone to step up and say, hey, I'll be that team this year. The Dolphins, I always like the Dolphins because I know they're going to beat New England once a year. If nobody, if the Dolphins go 5-1, and one, you can be assured that that one loss in the division is in Miami versus the Dolphins late in the season. You can count on that. You can go ahead and book that. The NFL will be doing themselves a huge disservice if they move that Dolphins game in Miami early in the season. I always want that to be late season, week 14 or later. That Dolphins-Patriots uh, game needs to be in Miami. Now, if they switch it around and, and give them the Patriots at home early in the season, that's probably going to turn into a loss. I like it right where it is. They need to keep it there. But that's the reason why I, I always get excited about the Dolphins when it seems like they can be good because they're the one team, not Buffalo, not the Jets, the, the Dolphins are the one team that could actually contend with the Patriots because they're not afraid of the Patriots. They are, are a team that could actually beat the Patriots, and they do it routinely. No one else in the division can say that. So I, I said all of that to say this. You got a head coach that <clears throat> I think – you should be excited about. I, I don't really know what you're getting, okay? The, the jury's still out on Brian Flores, but I, I'm excited for him. I, I'm hoping that he succeeds. You got a GM in Chris Greer that <clears throat> still kind of relatively new to what's going on, and um, I think he's still filling out the position, and um, there's a lot of things that need to be kind of filled in. There are a lot of blank spaces on this roster that need to be filled in. If, if I sat here and told you that the Dolphins didn't have a bunch of needs. I'd be lying to you. But above all else, you just need to have stability. There hasn't been stable. There hasn't been a stable foundation in Miami for what seems like seven years now. Seven, eight years. It's been a while since there's been a coach there. Joe Philbin was there for a little while. But you never thought that anything big was going to happen under Joe Philbin. And ever since he's left, there, it just seems like it's been a revolving door of players and coaches. And it, it, it just seems like it's never-ending. GMs have been coming and going left and right. Uh, maybe with Greer and now with Flores, maybe you have the starting of something new, something fresh, something tangible that is long-lasting in Miami. And maybe with Josh Rosen, you actually have a franchise quarterback because Ryan Tannehill – was never that guy, all right? And, and so uh, maybe he's he is, maybe he isn't. Uh, we'll see. The whole wanting to, to tank for Tua in 2020 is, is garbage to me because, one, I've always said this. Anytime you start looking forward to a prospect a year or two before they're actually going to be, I call it looking at minors. Don't look at the minors, okay? All right? Shame on you if you're looking at minors. Those guys are young. They're underage. Don't look at them, okay? By the time they get of age, they're not the same player you fell in love with two years ago, all right? It, it happens all the time, all right? Tua is the big thing now. Next year, Tua might not be as good, and everyone might not be clamoring for Tua as the number one pick. That guy could be someone else, for all we know. Bottom line is, what I'm saying is, the NFL is a league in which you can't afford to tank, all right? This isn't the NBA. This isn't Major League Baseball. You can't afford to be bad for one entire season and have your fans Feel like you're looking to be bad. Yeah, you'll hear a bunch of people say, yep, I want to tank. They may mean that, but they want to tank after their team starts the season one and seven. All right, they don't want to tank starting the season off. Everybody wants to win, all right? Now, again, the NFL is such a fickle sport, and it's a fine line between being six and 10 and 10 and six. And so even if you try to stink, you're going to win some football games. Because those guys on the roster aren't looking to tank. They're looking to fight for their lives, their job security. Hell, if it's not in Miami, it's going to be somewhere else. They got to put good tape on. So they're not buying into the whole tanking uh, philosophy. They're looking to win ball games. And even if you stink, you're going to find a way, unless you're just morbidly bad or you just got bad fortune, like the Browns did a couple of years ago when they had a horrible field goal kicking situation and they just had some really poor luck. But outside of that, even the worst teams are going to win three or four games a year. 
Because that's how fine a line it is in the NFL. You're going to win a game or two in the division because you know those teams. And you're going to slip up and win a game or two outside of the division just because that's the league we play in. Or that's the league they play in. And that's that's how the league goes. So um, the Dolphins were never going to be bad enough. And honestly, I think the, the Dolphins roster woes, woes, I think they're grossly exaggerated, to be honest with you. When you look at their roster and you look at what they have, yes, they're missing some pieces here and there. What roster is it, though? But when you look at their team, if some things come together, you can't tell me that the Miami Dolphins can't compete for a wild card berth. You, you can't tell me that the Dolphins in December aren't 7-7 seven and seven and looking to try to get to 9-7 and seven with three other teams for the sixth and final wild card spot. I would not be shocked, okay? I wouldn't be. If you told me that Miami was 7-7 seven and seven late in the, in the season, uh, you, we all know the rules to the game. They can't make the postseason. Ryan Fitzpatrick is going to start the year for them most likely. Josh Rosen is going to have an opportunity. But for all intents and purposes, at some point, at some point, even if he doesn't start the season, Ryan Fitzpatrick is going to start for this Dolphins team. I'm thinking he's going to start week one. And if Ryan Fitzpatrick starts for your football team, you're not allowed to make the postseason. I didn't make the rules. I just abide by them. You know the rules to the game, then play. But I've talked enough. Let's get into this Dolphins 2019 NFL draft. It was very abbreviated. Only six picks. Uh, but again, if you throw in the Rosen uh, trade, that's seven. And uh, they got in, got some players that they needed, and they got out. Let's talk about what they were able to do in this draft. And we start in the first round. Um, 13th pick overall, defensive lineman out of Clemson, Christian Wilkins, is the selection to get this Dolphins draft started. All right, so first off, not going to break him down. I've already done that on the Draft Prospects 101 series. So if you're looking for a thorough breakdown of Christian Wilkins and any other prospect I was able to get to prior to the draft with film, then the Draft Prospects 101 series is what you're looking for. Go to the playlist section on the Louis T Network on YouTube. Find the 2019 NFL Draft Prospects 101 series, and there you'll find all of the breakdowns that I was able to get to prior to the draft. Christian Wilkins being one of them. Um, I told you in that breakdown that I think I'm a little low on him. I need to be a little bit higher. Um, you know, I, I think I'm sleeping on Christian Wilkins and what he brings to the table. I know the guy's a talent. I, I've heard all about the guy's leadership skills and what he brings to the table from that standpoint. When you watch him, uh, he's a good football player. I just didn't feel like he was special, but I think I was sleeping on him. And, and the more film I watched, the more games I watched him play in, the more I started to come around and say, you know, this is a damn good football player, and I'm tripping. I'm tripping. And, and so um, Christian Wilkins is a hell of a football player. And sometimes you can get caught up because their defensive line was so good. All four of those guys were drafted in the 2019 NFL Draft. Austin Bryant, uh, Christian Wilkins um, also had, obviously, Cleveland Farrell going before all of them, which was a surprise to many. And um, the other defensive tackle, Dexter Lawrence. So all four of those guys are drafted. And, and when you have a, a, a chalked, stacked, loaded defensive line or front, in, in, as in the case of like Alabama where the front seven is usually loaded, um, you, you I often question just how good are some of these guys. Like one or two of them might, may be elite and then the other guys may be feeding off of the elite play and taking advantage of some opportunities that come because guys around them are elite. That wasn't Dexter Lawrence. He was one of the elite guys that was helping an Austin Bryant get drafted, okay? Uh, he was one of those guys that was making life easier for those linebackers and those guys in coverage on the back end. So um, this is a really good selection. I didn't think you necessarily needed defensive line help. So this was a little bit of a surprise. But again, when you're drafting as early as the Dolphins routinely are, which is in the top 15, pretty much best player available. You know, outside of, like, you don't need a left tackle, so you don't draft a left tackle. But... Um, and if you don't need a quarterback, you don't draft the quarterback. But outside of a couple of positions, it's best player available. And um, Christian Wilkins at that point of the draft was pretty much the best player available. Um, and you weren't looking for a quarterback I mean, because there were quarterbacks on the board at the, the time of your selection at 13, but you weren't interested in the quarterback position. And maybe you had your eye on Josh Rosen the entire time and, and had in the back of your mind an uh, uh, option to maybe trade for him. But um, this is a really good pick, and this can only help bolster your defense. Uh, even though I think you already have some talent along the defensive line, you don't have any edge rushers. It would have been nice to have gotten one at 13, potentially, but all of the elite stuff at this point were, were, were potentially gone. 
I like Brian Burns. I thought that would have been a better selection, looking at your situation. Uh, but two edge rushers in three years, probably not the best route to go, I guess, if you're the Miami Dolphins. I never liked Charles Harris. I remember t doing that video and talking about, this guy isn't very good. I haven't seen anything to change my mind. I didn't think he was a first-round pick then. I don't think he's a first-round pick now. I think you have a potential bust on your hands, but I could be wrong. And that light bulb, I, I talk about this with players all the time, the light bulb comes on at different times for different guys. So maybe Charles Harris is a late bloomer, and maybe year four is going to be the year he explodes for 10 and a half sacks, and you feel like, hey, we, we got it right. I don't know. I'm not saying. I'm just saying. But as you look at the Dolphins' needs, um, I have them in sequential order, in, in the order of importance, in, in which I think the Dolphins need these players in this particular draft. Quarterback was obviously the biggest need. You don't have a quarterback, you don't have a chance in this league. I talk about that all the time. Um, and so that was the first need on the board for the Dolphins. Um, and then I thought you needed edge rusher help. You, you got um, rid of one of your all-time sack leaders in Cameron Wake um, this offseason and even though he was getting up there long in the tooth and, and not the same Cameron Wake that was you know terrorizing quarterbacks for the past damn near, it feels like a decade, but probably more like eight years or so, um, he still was the best you had. And so you moved on from him. He's since gone to Tennessee. And you really don't have anything else at edge rusher. Charles Harris is pretty much it. And uh, he's not that good, if you ask me. So uh, you don't have much. Uh so you really needed some help at edge rusher, and I thought that was something you needed to maybe address in this draft as well. Um, offensive line, look, it doesn't matter who's at quarterback. Ryan Fitzpatrick, Josh Rosen, or whoever the hell else is at quarterback. If you can't protect them, you're not going to have a shot anyway. You know, And the, the fastest way to destroy and spoil a young quarterback is to get him beat up and have him see ghosts in the pocket and so you need to protect him. So whomever is back there, no more Jawan James. He moved on to the Denver Broncos in free agency. Um, you needed to solidify the right tackle position. There is a, a, a question out there as to what to do. Is this an internal situation that we handle? If you're a Dolphins fan out there, do we go out in free agency and try to address it? There wasn't a lot out there. Do we uh, address this and attack it in the draft? Uh, the Dolphins elected to go with the latter option and attack it via the draft. Now the question is, what do you do with Jesse Davis? Is he a guard or is he going to kick outside the tackle or are you going to move in one of your draft picks to inside to guard? That's the big question now. I don't know the answer to that yet. I guess we'll see, and it's a wait-and-see approach. Maybe the Dolphins have already talked about what they uh, plan to do, but right now I think that's something that they're exploring, and they get to see these guys get their hands on them, figure out what's best for the team, and then they'll move forward. What you don't want to do is you don't want to take one position and because you have one hole, switch a guy and create another hole. And now you have two players struggling at two different positions. If Jesse Davis is fine at right guard, so you leave him at right guard and you find your tackle of the future elsewhere. Uh, but we'll see what the Dolphins decide to do. They may kick him outside the tackle, kick in one of your draft picks to guard, and maybe you fix both positions. We'll see. Then you look at cornerback. Uh, obviously, um, I, I looked at the cornerback position and I think you got some stuff at corner. Um, I just wasn't blown away by the stuff. Now, Xavier Howard is a beast. I, I liked him coming out of Baylor, and he has proven me right. I said he had tremendous ball skills. I said this guy had some, some juice to him. There were some learning things that I thought I needed to see from him. But I said, all in all, the guy looks like he's got baller written all over him, and he turned out to be exactly that. Uh, but uh, there isn't much else unless Cordrero Tankersley is going to go back to a what he looked like at the end of his rookie season when I thought he was actually starting to play some good ball. I don't know what the hell happened to him in 2018. So right now I look at your cornerback situation and I'm like, you got McCain, you got um, Howard, and then I'm like, um, hands up. I don't know. So um, it's a question as to what you're going to do. I thought you could address it in the draft. You chose not to. But we'll, we'll take a look at that. Um, and then you got some other positions, running back, uh, no more uh, forever Frank. He moved on. There's no real veteran presence in that locker room, but that's fine. You got two young backs that you like in Kalen Balaj. And um, I always forget the um, ex-Alabama. Uh, um, I always forget his name, and I love him too. Uh, but I can't ever remember his name, and uh, it'll come to me though. But uh, you got those two backs, and at some point, 
you you're gonna have to turn those guys loose. I, I keep waiting for you guys to turn the ex Alabama product loose and just say, all right, it's your it's your backfield. Go be great. And they always just seem to go get another veteran, and they just it's like they don't trust him and they don't want to turn the keys over. Let the man go. Let him run. I remember at the end of the 17 season, he was tearing teams up. And then you go get Frank Gore and you stun his growth. Just turn the dude loose. And so I feel like this is the year. You don't have a choice now. There's no veteran back in there to take away snaps. Turn him loose. Let him go. Kalen Balaj behind him. And now you drafted another back. And I think you got a nice little running back room now with young guys, fresh legs. Go let him have at it. And then the, the last position is wide receiver. Look. I think there is a lot being made about the Dolphins' lack of production at receiver um, and lack of number one threat is more of what uh, everyone's saying. Now, you re-signed Devontae Parker in the offseason and kept him here um, for a little bit longer. And you got Kenny Stills, you got Jakeem uh, Grant, and then you also have uh, the ex-Kansas City Chiefs wide receiver. Um, that's four guys. In this league, you need... Um, a number one wide receiver if you're not going to have a bunch of guys that you feel like can get it done. I actually think you have a bunch of guys that can get it done. So the, I think it's over being overblown, this whole number one wide receiver thing. As we saw with the Rams, they don't have a number one wide receiver. They just got a bunch of guys that can get it done. You look at the Patriots. They don't have a true number one unless you want to uh, call uh, uh, Julian Edelman a number one. I, but he, I think it's just a collection of guys. It's a collection of guys that can get it done. And so... I look at your, this football team and I look at the receiver position in particular, Albert Wilson, Jakeem Grant, um, Devontae Parker, and Kenny Stills. That's your four guys. I thought you could have added another body in there that you really like. You got a bunch of dudes in there. Um, and maybe there are one or two more that you like and, and maybe you felt comfortable with what you had. But if they those Devontae Parker's biggest issue is he can't stay healthy. If he can stay healthy, Kenny Stills is one of the better number two options in the league. Um, you look around. I love Albert Wilson, and he's a guy you can get it to. He gets yards after the catch. Jakeem Grant is a very big gadget player, a guy that you give it to him in space. Look out, this guy could, you know, flip a play on his head and make a big play out of nowhere. So a lot of things with this Dolphins football team, but I thought you could have added some more help at receiver for whomever was going to be your quarterback. You got some stuff at tight end. It would have been nice to add something at receiver, but that's no here nor there. So um, I said all I had to say this. Christian Wilkins was your first-round pick, 13th overall. And you needed some help up front. You still need edge rushing presence, but you know what's going to make those edge rushers much better? Interior pressure. And uh, not only can he stop the run, Christian Wilkins can ask, also apply pressure on the quarterback. This is a big-time pickup for the Miami Dolphins and probably the best value you've had at 13. And so in the first round, 13th overall selection, defensive lineman out of Clemson, Christian Wilkins, for me, is... It's right high! It's a deep! It is high! So my comp for Christian Wilkins is B.J. Hill. If you didn't watch my Draft Prospects 101 series, then um, B.J. Hill is the comp. The ex-NC State product drafted by the New York Giants last year in the third round. Um, had a spectacular rookie season, five and a half sacks, always around the football for it. What, a, what was a down year for the Giants, but he was a bright spot on that defense. And so you're hoping that this guy comes in and has similar impact in his first season as a first round pick for this Dolphins defense. Uh, you go to the third round now, no, no second round pick because of the trade uh, with the Cardinals uh, to acquire quarterback Josh Rosen. Third round, 78th overall selection, oh, uh, offensive lineman out of Wisconsin, Michael Dieter is the pick. <laughs> So, the Dolphins take an offensive lineman here. So, as you can see, I've got quarterback marked off on the list of needs. Let's go ahead and take off offensive line as well. And let's talk about that for a second before we even get into Michael Dieter here. Um, look, the Dolphins got what I deem to be the best quarterback in last year's draft um, in Josh Rosen. Now, you can look at his 2018 tape and, and review what he did or didn't do with the Arizona Cardinals. That team was a mess. That's why they got rid of the coach. That's why they hit the reset button is because that team was an abject disaster. It was a failure last season. 
They didn't have enough talent. They didn't have enough players. They didn't have enough of anything. They didn't have enough coaching. It was a mess in Arizona. So you take everything that you saw from Josh Rosen with a grain of salt, the good, the bad, the ugly, the indifferent, whatever, you take it with a grain of salt because of the situation he was put in last year. I think this is a fresh start for him. I think if you can protect him, he could be cerebral with the football. He was ultra accurate at UCLA. He's a guy that can drive it down the field and, and create big plays via the passing game. I think something that he needs to work on is checking the football down, taking what the defense is, is giving you. That's something he struggled with at Eucala. It's something he struggled with last year. But that being said, there's definitely talent there uh, to be tapped into with Joshua Rosen. And now with a, a really good staff and, and a, a offensive coordinator like Jim Caldwell, I think it's a great landing destination for Josh Rosen. And I'm hoping that uh, this is a spot where he can flourish and, and really give the Dolphins something they really haven't had um, since maybe Jay Fiedler. Wow, did I just pull a Jay Fiedler out of my hat? Or out of my back pocket? Uh, and, and Jay Fiedler was never even a franchise quarterback. You haven't had a franchise quarterback since Dan Marino, but Jay Fiedler was the closest. Jay Fiedler was the closest. Um, at least he was. At least there was stability with Jay Fiedler. And so um, maybe he'll give you something you haven't had since Dan Marino, a franchise quarterback. We'll see. But you got to protect whoever is under center, whether it's Rosen or it's Fitzpatrick. You got to protect him. And uh, Michael Dieter is going to come in and offer you a little bit of that. And then some. Um, here's a guy. Let's get into Michael Dieter here. Uh, third round, 78th overall selection. 6'5", 309 pounds. 33-inch arms, 54 career starts for Michael Dieter. Uh, 24 of them at left guard, 16 at center, 10, or, and 14 at left tackle. So this is a guy with tremendous versatility, which is why I talked about Jesse Davis and him potentially um, staying at guard is because Dieter has experience at tackle. Now his experience came at left tackle, which you already have a left tackle, uh, and so you don't need one there. But... Um, if you can play left tackle, the, the theory is and the conventional wisdom is that you can play right tackle. Uh, we'll see what happens. This guy is uber versatile, as you can see. Um, and, and so I think that's something that drew him to the Miami Dolphins was his versatility and his durability. 54 consecutive starts. That's a lot of starts. That's about the maximum amount you can have playing college football unless you play for a program like Alabama or Clemson where you might be playing 15 games a season. 54 is a ton of games, man. Ton of games in college football. That being said, looking for a capable, durable, technically sound offensive lineman? Well, generally, Wisconsin is a good place to search. And Michael Dieter looks to be another solid lineman in a long list of quality Wisconsin products. Dieter's movement won't sell you, but his technique, hand placement, angles, etc., ability to stay engaged and seal toughness, durability, and most importantly, his versatility all display his true value. While there are limitations, he seems to work around them admirably and should give a team much needed flexibility, worst case scenario. So this is a guy that I really, really like here um, in Michael Dieter. I think he is a solid offensive lineman and he's one of those guys, whatever you ask him to do, he's going to do it to the best of his abilities. And the thing I love is that if you need a, a guy at center in a pinch, he can be that guy. If you need someone at guard, he can be that guy. If you need somebody at tackle, he can be that guy. And, and when you find that many, that many positions in one player, it makes life a lot easier when you start talking about roster management. And so um, you get in a pinch in a game, a couple of guys go down, and now all of a sudden you're reaching, grasping at straws. You got a guy on the roster that is comfortable playing in a number of different roles. And so... Um, I think he's a guy you drafted to play guard, to be honest with you. I think you're going to end up kicking Jesse Davis outside to tackle. That's how I feel as we sit here on June the 3rd. I could be wrong, but I'm going to tell you this too. And I generally don't talk about undrafted rookies because a lot of times those guys don't make your football team. You got an undrafted rookie by the name of Shaq Calhoun out of Mississippi State that I thought was going to be drafted. I was shocked when he was not picked. I fully expect him to make your football team. I'm just telling you. I fully expect Shaquille Calhoun to make your football team. We'll see. Again, I could be wrong, 
But I think you've added some stuff along the offensive line, including an undrafted guy in Shaq Calhoun that could actually give you some depth along the offensive line. And Michael Dieter is another guy that I think you drafted with the intent to start. And I think you're going to plug him in to that right guard position. And I think you're going to move Jesse Davis out to right tackle. Uh, we'll see. Uh, I think Dieter is much more comfortable at guard than he is tackle. And that's why I foresee him being the guard of the future um, at, at right guard. But again, I could be wrong. We'll see. We'll see what happens. But in any event, I, I like the move here. Like the player. To me, I, I comp him to Cody Whitehair, uh, the Chicago Bear product, ex-K-State guy, um, was, was a tackle at K-State, was kicked inside the center, um, and has been a damn good player for the Chicago Bears. Um, I can see the same thing happening to Michael Dieter, except I don't think he's going all the way inside to the pivot position. I think he's going to go to guard. But nonetheless, I think guard is a better fit for him than that of tackle. But we shall see. Um, I like Michael Dieter a lot. I think he's a really solid pickup here in the third round for a team that needed some help along the offensive line. You get it here in the third round, 78th overall selection, offensive lineman out of Wisconsin. Michael Dieter, for me, is... So now this is where we start getting into that New England Patriots um, influence here. And then I, I, I think I connected the dots correctly here. I, maybe I did, maybe I didn't. But fifth round, 151st pick overall. Uh, linebacker out of Wisconsin. So you're going back to the Wisconsin well. Once again, it was so nice you decided to go there twice. Andrew Van Ginkle is the selection. Andrew Van Ginkle. <laughs> I just like saying Van Ginkle. <laughs> That's a funny last name, Van Ginkle. So here's a guy that um, when you watch him, he doesn't overwhelm you with any one trait. No one characteristic, one attribute, nothing he does at any point. You go, whoa, that was really impressive. Uh, but he seems like a smart guy. His pro day was eye-popping. Um, he ran a lot faster, jumped a lot higher at the combine than I thought he was going to do watching the tape. So all of those things kind of surprised me because I actually didn't see that on tape. But um, he reminds me of someone that is going to remind you of someone where your coach came from and it all starts to make sense. So um, Andrew Van Ginkle, first of all, he was more of an edge rusher than he was a linebacker. And the thing you got to know about Brian Flores is he's going to come in, remember, ex-linebackers coach slash defensive coordinator of the Patriots last year. He's going to come in, and I think he's going to bring a lot of the same sediments and a lot of the same elements of the Patriots defense to Miami in the sense of it's going to be a multiple front defense, 3-4, three, 4-3, four, four, three, who gives a shit type of deal. Like, week in, week out, you're going to see a different defensive scheme based off of the opponent. So one week you could see a 4-2-5 alignment. The next week you could see a 3-3-5 three, three, alignment. Whatever best suits you that particular week with your opponent, that's what you're going to see. There's going to be heavy emphasis, though, put on the secondary. Like, those guys are going to be axed a lot of. You're going to have... And you've got three really talented safeties. You're probably going to need all three of them. You're going to probably ask Minka Fitzpatrick. And that's probably another reason you didn't feel the need to necessarily do anything at corner is because you got Minka Fitzpatrick and you're like, hell, worst case scenario, we need help at corner. We'll just stick Minka's ass at corner. We're cool. So you feel good about the, the versatility and flexibility you have at the safety position with all the players you have back there and McDonald and Minka um, and, and all of the guys that you have, uh, you feel good about all the stuff that you have and then the versatility. You're going to see a lot of different defensive fronts. And, and when you're playing multiple fronts, when you're going to be interchangeable in what you're doing, you got to have versatile football players. And, and look, you say a, a, what you want about Andrew Van Ginkle, he's very versatile, okay? Now, is he very good at anything that he does? Like I said, he's not uh, above average. He's average at just about everything he does. But um, there are some workable tools here, and if put in the right scheme, this guy may be able to flourish. So 6'3", 241 pounds um, is Andrew Van Ginkle. 
Um, the New England Patriots have had some unassuming edge rushers over the years that have risen from obscurity to be folk heroes in New England. Now Brian Flores may be looking for his own Rob Ninkovich here in Andrew Van Ginkle. Nothing about Van Ginkle screams impact player. And his combine and pro day numbers certainly do not match up with his film, but Flores is an ex-linebackers coach who knows what he's looking for, so I'll defer to him on this one. But I'll say this, Van Ginkle certainly finds himself around the ball an awful lot. Now, if you're looking for a quintessential um, Andrew Van Ginkle game, all right, try to say that one 10 times fast. Um, 2017 versus Ohio State in the Big Ten championship game is the best I saw from Van Ginkle on film. Um, he had an interception, pick six touchdown, where he dropped underneath of a, uh, uh, of a comeback route. Quarterback never saw him, picked it off, took it to the crib. He had a forced fumble and a recovery in that game, and he was all over the place. And one thing I can say about Van Ginkle is he knows how to get his hand in the cookie jar and yum, yum, eat him up. Yum, yum, eat him up. Force those fumbles, man. Get those cookies out on the ground. And um, he knows how to get in there and force turnovers. So uh, I watched him with that lawnmower rip job several times. He sticks his hand in there. Generally, he's coming out with the goodies. So um, this is a guy that I didn't see any moves that scare me as an edge rusher. There's no diversity. Uh, there's no... Um, there's no diversity whatsoever with his pass rush ability. Every rush looks the same. Now, I say that, and then I saw a spin. Now, I, I watched him in several games, and I only saw one spin, okay? There was an inside move, and this is not counting the twists and stunts that he was running. There was an inside move. I only saw that once in, in all the games that I watched. So what I'm telling you is it's generally up and down. It's I'm going to rush with a bull rush, which he's not all that strong. And I'm going to try to win with speed, and, and he's all, not all that fast. And then I say that, and then the man goes and runs a 4.56 at his, his pro day, jumped 38 inches on the vert at, at the combine, and, and a 10.2 and a broad at the combine, which blew me away because those are explosive numbers for a guy that didn't seem all that explosive to me on tape. So, again, I'm going to defer to Brian Flores on this one. And you know what I'm going to do? Is I'm going to take edge rusher off the board because I think you see this guy as a potential edge. So I'm going to take edge rusher off the board. But you know who I comp him to? Coming from New England, a guy that was really instrumental in the Super Bowl victory win, one of the unsung heroes of that game, was Kyle Van Noy, a guy that was drafted by the Lions. It didn't work there. You know, the Patriots are really good at getting cast-offs. Guys that didn't work out elsewhere, they bring them in, they shine them up, refurbish, refurbish them, and all of a sudden now this guy's electric for the Patriots. They did it with Kyle Van Noy. Kyle Van Noy, similar size, similar height, similar speed, similar athleticism to Andrew Van Ginkle. It just screams Kyle Van Noy. And remember, that was the linebacker's coach over there was Brian Flores. And he got a lot out of Kyle Van Noy. I'm thinking he may view Andrew Van Ginkle as his potential Kyle Van Noy two, three years down the road. I'm not saying. I'm just saying in any event, in the fifth round, 151st pick overall, linebacker out of Wisconsin, Andrew Van Ginkle, for me, is... So we move on to the sixth round, 202nd pick overall, offensive lineman out of the Ohio State University, Isaiah Prince, is the selection. So, Isaiah Prince is a 6'6", 305-pound offensive lineman with 35-inch arms, 41 career starts all consecutively at Ohio State. So, this is a guy with a ton of experience, all of it, at right tackle. So, here's a guy here, and this is another theory. This is another thought. I don't know. I don't think Isaiah Prince is ready to play, and honestly speaking, I don't think he's a starting uh, tackle potentially unless he cleans up some of his deficiencies but um, let's say the Dolphins really like what this guy brings to the table and they think he's ready come week one 
now you've got a situation where you just keep Jesse Davis at, at right guard and boom, you slide in Isaiah Prince and it's a seamless transition. You know, we'll see. I think Dieter is going to start somewhere along this offensive line, but um, that's no here nor there. So um, here's the deal on Isaiah Prince. He's big, he's mean, he's athletic, and he's long. All excellent traits to have as an offensive lineman. I'll even throw in physical as well. And then you get to his limitations. He doesn't bend his knees. His feet and body aren't synced in pass pro. He lunges way too much, which is a direct correlation to his feet and his body not being married together. All right. Also, he the swim and quick inside moves are his kryptonite. I can't tell you how many times I saw guys immediately beat Isaiah Prince with a simple inside move, whether it was a swim or his hard outside back inside. He could not compete with those moves. Why? Because he doesn't move his feet. At times, his feet get stuck in the mud, and he won't move. And instead of him moving his feet, he lunges. That's a way to get beat every single time, twice on Sundays, Mondays, and Thursdays. That being said, with all, and oh, by the way, with all of these faults, he's only a right tackle. He cannot play left tackle. You cannot subject your quarterback to blindside pressure with the way that this guy blocks. That being said, you clean up a few of these faults and a few of these um, limitations that he has, and you accentuate his strengths that he has, his length, his athleticism. This is a guy that can move a bit. He's got some long arms. He's got some some ability, all right? And some experience. That's that's vital as well, all right? And durability, okay? These are all things you love as an offensive line coach. His strengths, and you could have something here in the sixth round. I don't necessarily see it myself, not as a starter at least right away. I think he could grow into a starter for you, but I think he's more of a swing tackle, a guy that in a pinch, you, you got a tackle that goes down, Isaiah Prince can come in, and, and give you a little bit of relief um, along the offensive line. But um, you needed to shore up the offensive line, <clears throat> line, even if it was just depth. And I think you did that in this draft, getting a couple of Big Ten products in Michael Dieter and now here in Isaiah Prince. And so um, here in the sixth round, 202nd pick overall, offensive lineman out of Ohio State, Isaiah Prince is, for me, And the, the comp I have for Isaiah Prince is the ex-Auburn Tiger drafted by the Cleveland Browns, Sean Coleman, a guy that he looked the part of an NFL left tackle, but his inconsistencies worried me at Auburn, and they, they followed him to the league in, in Cleveland, and, and he was never really what they were hoping he would turn out to be for them in Cleveland, and you're hoping that Isaiah Prince fares a lot better. I think they're splitting images of one another, uh, uh, Isaiah Prince and Sean Coleman. So I um, think that's a very accurate comp for him there. Um, as we move on to the seventh round now, two seventh round picks, um, both in the backfield, coincidentally enough, for the Miami Dolphins, the first of which the 233rd pick overall, fullback out of Auburn, Chandler Cox is the selection. <laughs> So let me go on and say that I actually like this pick of Chandler Cox here. And I didn't know if the Dolphins were one of those teams that actually would use a fullback. Obviously, Brian Flores coming from uh, New England, where they had James Devlin, one of the best fullbacks in all of football. Um, you thought well, maybe he'll be interested in having a fullback. But again, I don't think he's in control of the offense. You bring in Jim Caldwell, you're going to let Jim Caldwell do whatever the hell he wants to do with the offense. So I wasn't sure if... And, and Caldwell at times has had fullbacks, but at the end of his run in Detroit, he's like, to hell with a fullback. We'll do without a fullback. So I, I wasn't sure if that was something you would have been int interested in. But um, if you're going to pick a guy to be your fullback, I like Chandler Cox a lot. 6'1", 236 pounds. I think there's some untapped potential here as well. Um, physical, no-nonsense blocker, willing to do anything and everything to help his team on any given snap. Um, his play on the field was fearless and fast. And his pro date helped solidify that. Um, he ran a 4'7 flat in a 32-inch vert at 236 pounds. That's pretty impressive for a fullback. And um, 
this guy can run. He can move a little bit more than I think you saw at Auburn because they didn't really get him the rock a ton. But you watch him as a lead blocker. You go watch him in the Alabama game in 2018. There's a play that's called back. It's like a 78-yard touchdown run. He's got the kickout block on that play, and he's smashing dudes that entire game. Like, he is about his business, and he's opening up holes, and he's making some serious contact. He's definitely a pad smasher, all right? He's popping pads, man. I, I mean, I really like this dude a lot. And while he didn't have a ton of touches at Auburn, there may, may be some untapped potential as an athlete as well here with Chandler Cox. And I really believe that. If you're a team that values the fullback and will throw him a bone every once in a while, like the Patriots do with James Devlin, they throw him the ball. Pa Tom Brady is not opposed to throwing the goddamn uh, water boy to football. If, if he puts on a jersey, Brady will spread it around judiciously to everyone and anyone. And that includes the fullback out of the backfield. You want to sleep on the fullback? Allow him to run un unmolested out in the flats? Brady will throw it to him and let him rumble, stumble, and bumble for 11 yards. And, and that's not even what Chandler Cox... You get Chandler Cox to football in space, he's not rumbling, stumbling, and bumbling. He's looking to make something happen at 4-7. So I'm just saying... I'm not saying... I'm saying that this guy just... He's got, it's a little juice here, man. And so I comp him to a guy that has a little bit of lineage in the league in Derek Watt, the brother of, yes, J.J. Watt. Um... Drafted by the um, uh, Los Angeles Chargers a couple of years ago, um, out of Wisconsin, a physical guy at the point of attack, but also a guy that's an athlete that can catch it and do a little something. So I think he reminds me a lot of Derek Watt, and I think this is a really solid pickup. If you're going to utilize a fullback, this is a nice guy to have. Here in the seventh round, 233rd pick overall, fullback out of Auburn, Chandler Cox for me is... And we wrap up this Dolphins draft in the seventh round. The very next pick after Chandler Cox, you go and get another back. This time out of Washington, Miles Gaskin is the selection. Really like uh, Miles Gaskin a lot. This is a guy that was very accomplished at UW. Um, it's, I really felt like Miles Gaskin was at UW for 27 years. I, I was like, damn, he ain't graduate yet. And, and that was two years ago when I said that. And then I looked up and I said, damn, he ain't graduate yet. And then I looked over and my dad had a head full of gray hair. Uh, and I was like, yo, he ain't graduate yet. It just seemed like the, the time just kept passing. My dad didn't have any hair. All right. Um, that's how long he was at school. And my dad grew a chia pet and, sh and chopped it off and grew another one. And, and he was still at school. Like, this guy wouldn't go away. But it, it just speaks to his ability to stay healthy, one. And two, his production was off the charts at UW. And um, it gave you um, a little bit of... It gives you a little bit of versatility in your backfield. You know, it gives you another guy that you can get the football to um, in your backfield. And I think he's a guy... Kenyon Drake is his damn name. I couldn't think of it. I said, it's going to kill me if I don't figure it out before the end of this video. Kenyon Drake, Cannon Balaj, and now you got Miles Gaskin. I like this running back room. I really do. And if you're going to add in another guy, like a fullback, Chandler Cox, I think you got a complete running back room now. Let the young boys run, man. Let the young boys loose. Stop bringing in veterans to, to try to tie the group in. Let the, long, let the young boys run, man. Damn, let them run. I like Kenyon Drake a lot. Miles Gaskin is undersized yet highly productive runner with plenty of versatility. Um, pass catcher, running back, kick returner, over a thousand career touches in his collegiate career. Wow, that's a lot of touches. That's a lot of usage, a lot of tires off, a lot of tread off those tires, and a lot of mileage on that car. All right, that being said, uh, while being the first Pac 12 back to rush for a thousand yards in four straight years is quite the achievement. It also points to his high usage rate, but conversely, his, du his durability. You got to be durable to get 230 some odd carries every single year, catch it another, you know, 20 times or so, and early in his career, you know, field kickoffs as well. You got to be really durable to be able to do that. Um, he's not going to be penciled in as anyone's number one back um, in the league. However, he's proven to be 
very capable if asked to do so and will add tremendous value to the a running back room and versatility to a depth chart. I really like the uh, addition of Miles Gaskin on this particular roster. It's a young uh, back, running backs group, um, and they don't have a guy quite like Miles Gaskin, a, a, a guy that can really do all of the things that he does in his body type. He's a smaller back. You, Kenyon Drake is a, a upright. I love my upright runners. You know how I am. Kenyon Drake is a six foot, six one type of guy. Uh, Kalen Balaj is a six one, six two guy. Now you get a smaller, shiftier back. I think it's a nice contrast to the guys you have already in your backfield. And so this is a nice little piece here to add in the mix. And you know who my comp is for him? And I think it's a strong comp. I really like it. Gio Giovanni Bernard out of Cincinnati by way of North Carolina. He's a guy that has been really good and effective when healthy in this league. Uh, similar stature, similar ability to run, make people miss, do all of the things you like for a back to do on, as a third down back in this league. And I think there's a place in this Dolphins uh, roster for a guy like Miles Gaskin. And I think this is a good home for him, a good fit for Miles Gaskin here in the seventh round, 234th pick overall. Running back out of my um, running back out of uh, UW, Miles Gaskin wraps up this Dolphins draft as so. As you can see, the Dolphins took care of four out of the six needs that I had. I thought that they could have addressed corner, but I talked about that already. That Minka Fitzpatrick and his versatility. Um, it makes you feel maybe a little bit more comfortable. Maybe you feel good about uh, Cordray or Tankersley coming back and having a strong uh, 2019 after a lackluster 2018. And you, you like uh, McCain. You love Xavier Howard. You gave him the monster deal this offseason, and rightfully so, well-deserved. And so maybe you feel a lot better about your cornerback situation than people are leading on or, or you know, the last regime may have thought. And now, all of a sudden, you look at uh, what you are able to do um, with some of your other positions. I think your strongest position on the team, arguably, is linebacker. I think you got a ton of stuff at linebacker. A lot of young, fast, athletic guys that can run to the football um, at the linebacker position. I think that's your best position. Obviously, edge rusher, even though you drafted Andrew Van Ginkle, I thought that was a position that you needed to address via the draft. Um, maybe Charles Harris steps up. You know, maybe he's the new guy, and I, I don't know. I, I, I really don't know what to expect um, off the edge for the Dolphins. And then receiver, I thought um, you could have added a receiver um, late in the draft and, and been fine, but you got a bunch of stuff. You even got um, um, the ex-Dallas Cowboys wide receiver, um, Bryce um, Butler, on your roster. He's he's really solid. You know what I mean? He was, he was a really solid player for the Dallas Cowboys, had a cup of tea in Arizona, he, he's a really solid fifth option on your football team. If if, if you want to go that route, I think you're fine. This You didn't have to, as you can see, wide receiver was the very last need on the list of needs. You didn't have to get a receiver this year. You know, it wasn't a necessity. I would have much rather have seen you go after edge rusher earlier in the draft than, you know, go after a wide receiver. Um, with that second round pick, losing that second round pick to a quarterback, it was, it was a, a, a big need. Quarterback was the biggest need you had, so I don't have a problem with that. Uh, I would have loved it if you could have gotten an edge rusher. You know, and maybe the first round pick should have been an edge rusher. I thought you had enough depth along your defensive line on the interior to maybe bypass defensive tackle and go get an edge rusher at 13, but you can never have enough defensive linemen, period. End of discussion. So I'm not going to beat you up for getting a guy that is going to be a great locker room guy, going to be a leader amongst men, and also going to be highly productive on the football field. I'm not going to beat you up for doing that at all. Um, he was the guy at 13 that you pegged as a Miami Dolphin. You took the, you took it and you pulled the trigger, and and so that's your draft. Let's take a look at what the Dolphins scored in the 2019 NFL Draft wrap up.
So as you can see, that video went a lot longer than it was supposed to, but I get passionate when I talk about the Miami Dolphins for some reason. I think it's because they're the team that I want to compete with the Dolphins in the AFC East. I think that's why I, I get passionate about the Dolphins because they're the one team that I think can beat the, the, the Patriots. Nobody else in the division has shown the ability to beat the Patriots on a consistent basis except the Dolphins. So they're the one team that I associate with maybe potentially being able to compete in the AFC East, but they're never good enough. Yet they beat the Patriots once a year. It, it drives me crazy, and I, I feel like th th there's untapped potential on this Dolphins roster, but whether it's mismanagement up above or mismanagement with the coaching situation or just a roster that underachieves, I really can't quite put my finger on it all the time, but you know it when you see it. And, and it's been somewhat dysfunctional in Miami for quite some time. Maybe some stability is coming your way in the form of Chris Greer and now Brian Flores as your new head coach. We'll see. I'm rooting for the guy, as I mentioned at the top of the show, and uh, I'm hoping that things change for the better for the Miami Dolphins. This is a solid draft. It was very, like I said, very succinct to the point, very compacted draft, but they got their players and they got out and they got themselves a quarterback, more importantly, above all else. They got Josh Rosen, and I think he could be a guy that could potentially be a cornerstone for this football team uh, for now and into the future. So I'm your man, Louis T, signing off. Remember, if it's not your man, T, it's not the best NFL coverage. It could be. Also, if you haven't checked out the Louis T Network podcast, what are you waiting on? Louis T Network podcast, great content there, available on all platforms, Google Music Play, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, Spotify, and, of course, the website, louistnetwork.net. If you haven't subscribed to the Louis T Network, what are you doing on YouTube? Man, stop playing and hit that subscribe button and turn on your notifications so you don't miss a thing. I'm your man, Louis T. Until next time, you guys have a good one. Louis.